takes 15 minutes and at, at the end we um, we have the uh, questions that were sent uh, by ed and um, by dr farida so we will have both of them and uh, then we will go on to uh, see what results we have got from people who uh, uh, chose to answer these beforehand so all the uh, participants have uh, these questions from beforehand so we can see what the results are so we can start from dr farida and that's the first session uh, first uh, that's going to be her talk and followed by all the three and i see that michael feeling is here i was told that he won't be able to join us good to see you michael I, i'm on call and i have surgeries going on but uh, i've pre-taped my talk so do you have a copy of the talk yes we do perfect and i also submitted questions did you get those uh, I think Imad might have got them. I don't know. I'll check with her. He, with him. No, he, sir. I, we haven't got your questions, but we do oh, have really? your presentation. Huh. Yeah. I did prepare them, and I thought that those were forwarded. Are you sure you don't have those? I'll check with my communications person. But I, I, I put those together yesterday. Okay. I created okay. five okay. Uh, multiple choice questions. Yep. Okay. Uh, Salman. So we, yes, Salman. Yes, Nelson. Yeah. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. I don't know if you got my email. I'm. I've got a little bit of a time um, co constraint. I have to sign off at eight forty-five, so I'll be. I'll be able to. That's my time, which is about fifteen minutes from now. So, and Michael, you have to leave anyway. Is that yes? Right? Yeah. So if I so, could so, do so my. So then we start with Dr. Farida, then uh, Dr. Yasiku, and then we just show your recording at third. Is that fine? And um, are you available I, until four? Uh, well, 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 it's, it's German time, three thirty. So ninety minutes. No, I'm not available for the full. No, 90 no, I minutes. mean Dr. Benson. So Michael, you, how long can you stay? Um, if I could uh, do my question and answer after my lecture, that would work. And lecture has to be second or third. Um, if it could be second, it would be preferred, but I could cope with it being third, but it would, might be a bit tight. So, Salman, it's up to you to decide. So, because Dr. Uh, Nelson has to go, Michael has to go, and, uh, well, Dr. Bansell is available. Maybe he can give two talks. <laughs> how, how, can we, how can we set it up? What is the best? Salman, what do you think? Well, I won't, I won't take more than 15 minutes, I, that's for sure. So wherever you want me to put me in, we'll be fine. Dr. Farida, can you, can you do a third speech? Um, well, I can, I guess, uh, wind up in 15 minutes. So I'll try my best. That's what I can do. But please keep me the first speaker because I need to okay. leave as well. Okay, Why? so I see the good thing is that we will be in time. <laughs> Why don't we leave him in where she's at? Um, then Nelson, then Michael, because okay. Nelson's got to go soon. Okay, let's let's start. Uh, Louis, you wanna you wanna start the introduction or what is the? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Yeah, you can. Then maybe you can start with Dr. Farida. Then second yes. is uh, Dr. Oyesiku, and then third is Dr. Felix, and fourth is Dr. Benzel. I introduce Felix and Benzel. And you introduce Dr. Farida and Nelson. Is that okay for you? It's okay. Yeah, then let's start. Imad, are you there? Can we start? Yes, sir, we can. Let's yes, start sir. because we are already seven minutes late. Just tell us when you start. So should I run the presentation of Dr. Mike? Are we online? Everybody with us? Yes, sir, we are. Okay. The participants so, have Dr. Been Boba, please read. give us some introductory words. Wait, wait a okay, second. Okay. Have the participants been allowed into the room? That's what I was asking. They're, we are online already. They are all online, right? Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Dr. Boba, okay. Louis, start. Okay. <laughs> okay, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all the world. Thank you for the one more webinar, Professor Sharif. Thank you, thank you to point this, this meeting together. My president, Nelson, it's great honor to see you again, Professor Benzel, Professor uh, Michael. Do you know, the science today is under attack. 
the business, the fake news, the social media. Today is difficult to understand what's happening in the world and to, and to read what you wanna read or wanna learn. And the most important today, the credibility of the journals is the only pillar that you have today for the science. It's a great pleasure for the, our committee, Education and Training, together with the Spine Committee of the World Federation to organize this meeting with the giants in the science to see where you are, where you go. Thank you, Professor Nelson. Thank you, all of you, to put this thing together. And let's start our meeting. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. So our first speaker is Dr. Farida. She will talk to us about um, how to prepare a research protocol. Please start. Thank you very much, Joshim. I hope all of you can see my screen and I hope all of you can hear me. Um, I would appreciate if you can write your questions in the chat boxes because I'll try to um, answer as many as I could during my um, uh, session. And uh, all the questions I ask you, if you could please answer in your chat boxes, that'll be great. So I'm going to just start my uh, talk and I'm going to keep it as brief and as precise as possible to complete it in 15 minutes. So um, basically, the, the, um, at the end of this uh, session, the participants will be able to know the tools needed to initiate clinical research, just a sort of a basic idea, and the outline of a clinical research protocol. So why do you need to design a protocol? Uh, one would argue that you have so much of data around you, why don't you just publish it, right? So as you all know that all great creative work is built on strong foundation and basically a pr good protocol, a good synopsis provides that foundation to your research. And moreover, if, if you want to publish your study, you need an ERC approval, which is like an approval from the ethical review committee or an institutional review board. And for that you need to submit them your protocol so that they can approve it and further you could start your uh, study. So the first thing which you need to come up with is a good research question. And, and what is a good research question like? A good research question should be specific. Uh, it should be uh, answerable as in measurable. It should be relevant. To, to your maybe local setting, to your speciality. It should be feasible, not very difficult to answer. It should be novel, it should be innovative, something which has not been done in the past. And last but not the least, it should be ethical as well. So what are the steps of, of uh, writing a clinical research protocol and then publishing your study? First of all, you come up with a broad research topic. After that, you start searching literature to find a gap so that you have a rationale to, to do your research. Then you write your objectives, which should be measurable, specific, and then you design a research protocol with the complete methodology, the data analysis methods, the ethical considerations, the questionnaire, whatever the study design is like. Then you need to get an ERC or an IRB or IRC, whatever you call it, an institutional review board approval. After that, you start collecting your data, analyze and interpret results, and then you write a manuscript. And finally, you would like to disseminate your um, uh, study results through uh, publication. So the, the most important thing, or I would say the most, most catchy thing, which anybody, any researcher would want to look at the first thing in your research is your title. And how would, should you frame your title? It should reflect the objectives of the study. And it's usually written after you've, you've come up with the whole protocol because it is a true representative of, of the whole research plan. So uh, writing objectives, it's very, very important to write your objectives, which are measurable, which are which actually follow this, this uh, smart mnemonic, which is that um, specific, uh, measurable, and um, attainable, relevant, and your study should, of course, finish on time. So let's just discuss um, 
the primary objective and the secondary objective. So, so the first thing which comes into your mind, the first question which comes to your mind is basically your primary objective. And any further questions you would want to answer with that primary objective are your secondary objectives. For example, this is just uh, one um, uh, topic which I have come up with, which basically suits uh, the neurosurgery speciality as well, because I'm a family physician. So uh, I am dealing with a lot of researchers from various specialities. So I, I hope you would be able to relate to this, to determine frequency of cervical injuries in motorcycle riders presenting after road traffic accident to emergency in Karachi. And the secondary objective for this could be to assess the risk factors associated with uh, severity and prognosis of cervical injuries among motorcycle riders presenting after RTA. So for this objective, could you come up with uh, the background of the topic, if you're writing an introduction for this specific objective, what would you want to write in the background of this topic? Could you write in your chat boxes? What would you want to write in the background of this topic? Cervical injuries among motorcycle uh, riders coming to emergency in a specific location. So what would you like to see in the background of this topic? If you're reading the introduction or if you're writing the uh, introduction, epidemiology, uh, Pragnesh, you're saying, yes, you would want to know what are what is already known about it in your specific uh, location, or it could be sort of international data as well. So you would want to search some literature, know about this specific topic as to you know, what it means uh, locally for your uh, population. So uh, literature. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Essen is saying RTA states national and international data, of course. So you need to know the international data, the local data, any previous studies done, and finally, the gaps in the literature. That's very, very important to know because once you know the gaps in the literature, then you will be able to come up with the rationale of your study. Unless you know what is not known, you cannot design your study, uh, which is sort of novel and innovative, right? So you need to know the gaps. And finally, you come up with the rationale of the study. So these are the components of the introduction of your protocol. And this will also be the introduction of your manuscript and your publication whenever you do that after data collection. And finally, you come up with the objectives. So uh, let's see if you could come up with a title for these objectives, the same objectives. Could you come up with a title for these objectives? These were the objectives. Could you come up with a title for these objectives? A short catchy title maybe, or maybe a long one which answers the questions and covers both the objectives. Analysis of cervical injury due to motorcycle RTA. So Dr. Himanshu, you might want to remove the analysis of part in it, and you might want to just write cervical injury due to motorcycle RTA. Yes, that's a good title. And maybe you want to uh, mention your location as well, where, where you're doing your study. So these are just a few suggestions. Cervical injuries after RTA among motorcyclists in Karachi. Frequency and associated factors of cervical injury among motorcycle riders in Karachi. Dr. Fazli has written cervical spinal injury due to RTA in urban population. Yes, you could, you could also use that title. Frequency and severity of cervical injuries among motorcyclists with helmet and no helmet in Karachi. So uh, quite a few of you might be wondering as to, you know, what helmet has, to, has got to do with it because it's already something which is in law and you have to follow it. So if you would just like to see the condition of traffic in Karachi, that's, that's how it is. So you can imagine the risk factors which are there. Uh, Dr. Pragnesh says, how does motorcycle injury relate to cervical spinal injuries? Is that a question or is that a title of, of your study? Uh, well, you could use it as both. So methodology, uh, these are the components of metholo methodology and I'm just going to um, just touch on it, just give you the basics of it. So operational definition. It is the definition of exposure and outcome variables of interest and their means of measurement, but it should be specific to your objective. It's, it's not a dictionary definition. It's, it's, it should be measurable and very pertinent to your study, right? 
Yes, Sandeep, you're right. You might not have any uh, traffic accidents at that kind of traffic, but but we know the, the rates of RTA coming to our emergency and believe me, it's really high. So, um, okay, so this is just an example of operational definition for cervical injury. So what do you think, which one is the correct one? The first one is, as you can read it, I won't go through it. And the, and the second one is injury to the cervical vertebrae or neck as a result of RTA among those riding a motorcycle. So which one do you think is the correct operational definition for your study, right? So which is a, which is a relevant one? Somebody says B. Any other guesses? Which one is the correct definition for cervical injury for your study? So the first one has been taken from, of course, uh, Google. So yes, Dr. Roma, she says the second one, that's absolutely right, because that's something which is measurable, right? So that's correct. Okay, so how would you define RTA? Any accident while riding a bike motorcycle on the road or the second one? Which one do you think is the correct operational definition for your study with the objectives you've already seen? What do you think about this? Dr. Himanshu says A. Okay. Any other replies? Which one is the correct operational definition for your uh, study? Any, anybody thinks it's, it should be B? B? Okay, so you see the B is, is again the dictionary definition, right? It's, it's just taken from Google. So that's not the correct definition for, for the, uh, the sample you would like in your study, right? So your operational definition should be pertinent, relevant to the study which you are doing, right? So A is the correct answer. So coming to study design, if I just broadly classify study design, it is either experimental or it is observational. So in experimental study design, the researcher intervenes. That's the basic difference. In observational study design, you just sit back and observe, right? You don't do anything, you don't intervene, you don't experiment. So that's the basic difference. So when you're talking about observational study designs, you can either do it as a survey, which is known as cross-sectional study design, or you can do it as, as in you can see the relationship of risk factors with outcomes, which you, you can use a case control study design or a cohort study design for that. So let's just give, give you examples, give you a few examples, and maybe you could, you could uh, guess and tell me whether you know which study design is the best one to use for these objectives. So to determine frequency of cervical injuries, that's the same objective I have already mentioned in motorcycle riders presenting after RTA to emergency. So which of the following study design would you use for this objective? Which of the following study design is the most appropriate one for this objective? Observational is right, uh, Rabi, but that's not an option, right? So you need to choose from A, B, C, D, or E. So which one of these study design is the best one for this objective? Dr. Yannick says B. Yes, that's right. I just said, this is a survey, right? You're trying to know the frequency. So B is the correct answer. You would use a cross-sectional study design for this particular objective. How about this one? Spinal cord dysfunction after COVID-19. So which study design is this one? Spinal cord dysfunction after COVID-19. Dr. Simon says uh, case control. Did you say case control? Dr. Essen also says case control. Well, um, because this is, maybe you do not know the, the background of it. This is something which is not reported uh, that frequently, right? It, it's just been reported a few times. Yes, it's, it's a very rare thing. It's, it's something rare, right? So if there's something really rare, and you don't find it usually, it, it occurs maybe in a decade or more than that. So that's a case report. So case report is basically a study design which is used 
for very rare cases which just occur once in a while. Okay, what about this one? To compare risk factors associated with brain versus cervical injuries after RTA? Dr. Engda says T. So you're comparing two types of injuries and you're comparing the risk factors among those who have brain injuries versus those who have cervical injuries. So if you're comparing risk factors, a case control study design would be a better one right what about this one early versus late surgical decompression for thoracic spinal cord injuries which one do you think is the best study design for this so early versus late surgical decompression for thoracic spinal injuries a himanshu says rct rabit says prospective cohort Maybe the best study design, if you say, would be C. Yes, that's right. Randomized, you could, you could do a randomized control trial to um, know the outcome of, you know, the comparison uh, of, of early versus late surgical decompression. What about this one? Early versus late surgical decompression for cervical spinal cord injuries. Which study design would you want to use for this, this objective? Now, this is tricky, right? Everybody would, I'm sure, say C because... We just uh, did it for another objective, which was similar. So why is everybody saying D? May I know? I see that most of you are saying D. Rabi says, because this is an emergency. Um, well, Rabi, it's basically unethical to do this as a randomized controlled trial because all of you are, I'm sure, neurosurgeons, and you would know that this is already something which is known, right? Isn't, isn't it that, you know, early surgical decompression has better results in cervical spinal cord injury? Isn't it that? I think so. So if, it, if it's already known, you wouldn't want to do it as a randomized controlled trial. You might want to just observe and see, you know, what's going on. So you might want to do it as a prospective or a retrospective cohort rather than a randomized controlled trial, because this would be unethical to do this because it's already known. Do you get my point? So again, coming to the uh, same objective, which we were discussing earlier on, to determine frequency of cervical injuries in motorcycle riders after RTA, you need to document the setting of the study and the duration of the study. So what would be the setting of the study? Where are you doing it? You're doing it in emergency departments of, for example, 10 public and private sector tertiary care hospitals of Karachi. So that's the setting. And for duration of the study, you might want to use a Gantt chart, which gives you the complete timeline. You could also make it on, on Word or Excel as you wish, so that you know, you know, where, how much time would you take to complete the whole study and get a publication from this paper. Most of you must be trainees and you have short uh, period of time to publish your studies. So sample size, you have to also come up with the sample size through different softwares, for example, OpenEpi and, and WHO software. And you need to know a sample size so that, you know, uh, you could prove your proof, you, you could have enough evidence against the null hypothesis and you could prove your point, right? You could have significant results. So you need enough sample size to prove your point. And then sample selection. So, for example, if you're talking about the inclusion and the exclusion criteria for this specific objective, the same objective we've been discussing, what do you think it should be? Which one of these is the correct inclusion criteria for the specific objective to determine frequency and severity of cervical injuries in motorcycle riders presenting after RTA? So, which one is correct? Dr. Essen, it's going to take a long time if you if I give you a demo to uh, to calculate the sample size. I'm sorry, I don't have that much of time, but I could help you with it. I'm going to send you my email address, and then you could just email me, and I could send you some some you know videos on it. Okay, right. So the answer is all patients visiting ER after motorcycle RTA. And if I talk about the exclusion criteria, you might not want to include patients who are brought dead on arrival after uh, 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 RTA because, you know, you could not investigate them. You could not know the severity uh, and, of course, the prognosis of this. 
So there are different sampling techniques you would want to use for your study. And uh, for beginners, I would suggest that you should use non-probability sampling because it's more convenient and it's cost effective as well. You need to come up with your questionnaire and the data collection procedure. You can come up with an online questionnaire or uh, you know, a written questionnaire, but it's easier to record data from an uh, online questionnaire because it's automatically entered. And then you need uh, help from a, a biostatistician for data analysis. You need to be very uh, specific about the ethical issues you, which you might be having during the study because you know, otherwise you wouldn't get an ethical approval and it's, it's not right to do the study anyways. You need to know um, referencing manager, how to reference your study so that you're uh, efficient. And this is the checklist of the research protocol. You might want to take a screenshot of it or you want to take a picture of it to keep it with you so that you know when you're coming up with your own protocol, you have the list. So that's about it. And this is my email address. You could send me your uh, queries. I can help you out with, with any specific component of, of this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Farida. Very nice. Uh presentation about the designing as the research protocol. Um, Luis, there you are. Uh, I didn't see you. Maybe you can introduce uh, Dr. Nelson Oyesiku. Professor Nelson, President of the Federation, don't need introduction. <laughs> or the <laughs> former <laughs> editor of, of neurosurgery, a bright neurosurgeon, a great teacher in science. Professor, please go ahead. <laughs> Your microphone is off. It's still off. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now it's okay. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can yes. you see the screen? Yes, yes. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lewis. And thanks, everyone, for inviting me to join this uh, occasion. Um, Lewis is right. I'll be... Who sees the screen? Uh, no screen. We can't see at the moment. Uh, Nelson, we can't please, see the can... screen. How about now? Not yet. No. You have to we saw your screen before. How about now? No. You have to click on the share screen button. I, I can see it. Can share the screen. Okay, let's see here. Not sure why it's not showing. Share screen. How about now? Nope. No. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what went wrong. Okay. Um, so Lewis is correct. I'm, I'm still editor in, uh, in chief of the neurosurgery publications until August when I will hand it off to um, Dr. Konzioka. So uh, I've been asked to talk about writing the man in manuscript. Um, so here we go. So the first thing is I, there are many resources available to learn about this. You can, uh, residents can learn from faculty and other colleagues and there are lots of seminars and courses out there on manuscript preparation. The internet is replete with sources as are many reference books. One particular source that I like that we were instrumental in putting together is this series uh, on the CNS website, it's free. It consists of six modules about how to design a study, uh, what you need to do to submit a, a manuscript, elements of study design, statistical analyses, the database development that's required for many of the clinical studies, and then finally, how to prepare a manuscript. So, that's the URL, uh, so you can copy that if you wish, or take a screenshot so you can use it to um, source that information. 
there's also other journals, uh, Nature, for example, the Nature Publishing Group has um, um, a wonderful series of webinars online so that you can use that for as a source of uh, uh, information on how to prepare a research paper. Here's another source uh, that's also uh, available on writing and publishing, gives you all kinds of tips and tricks uh, for, for uh, manuscript preparation. Okay, so what are the parts of a manuscript? As you see here, title is the first thing, abstract, introduction, and so on, and so on, all the way to references. But I would submit that this sequence of events is not necessarily the sequence you should utilize when you're actually preparing a manuscript. For example, the first thing that you could write, the first section of the manuscript that you can write, even before you have one data point, even before you have one result or one chart or figure is your methods, because the methods are the basis upon which the study is um, performed. So you should be able to write the methods, whether it's a clinical design or a laboratory project or systematic review or whatever it is, you should be able to write the methodology first. And then see, following that, um, the other elements will follow ending and culminating with the last piece, which is the abstract, which is the key um, material that you're gonna send off. Uh, and that's what the editors are gonna read first, uh, as well as the title, right? Now, so going on to the specific sections of the, of the paper, starting with the title. The title is by far and away the most important part of the, of the paper. Uh, it is what will attract or repel uh, the editor or a reviewer from the paper. So the, the, the title may actually determine whether the paper gets read in the first place. If the title pretty much turns the, the editor off, or becomes apparent that it's not worth reviewing, that may be, be the end of the journey for that paper. Uh, so avoid long rambling titles, keep the titles active, crisp and to the point, informative, so it's easy to tell what it is. Avoid acronyms and abbreviations in the title, spell things out so people don't have to guess what you're saying. And as you see, I gave three examples of, of the title uh, of the paper, and it's pretty clear that the one that is most informative, most active and most crisp is the first one, the effects, I'm sorry, sorry the, the middle one, the heat melts ice. The first one, the he, effects of heat on ice could be anything, maybe no effect, be uh, whatever. Whereas the active title, heat melts ice, is pretty clear as and clearer than the other two options. The abstract, as I said, is the most critical part of the paper um, in terms of assessment, overall assessment, because it is in the abstract that the the uh, main objective of the, uh, uh, of the manuscript will be placed. The most important results should be put in the abstract, the punchline, the conclusions and significance should be in the bottom part of the abstract. And again, as with the title, you should avoid acronyms and abbreviations that, that are not, not easy for anyone to figure out. And it should be revised until flawless because as I said, that's what is gonna first take the attention of the um, editor. Okay, so what's the second piece of the manuscript? Well, the introduction, right? So what's the introduction about? Well, as the word implies, it introduces the paper. So first thing people wanna know is why is this study important or why is it necessary or why was it done? And that's the first question. Second question is you've got to provide a brief setting, a background, because if, if someone is going to read the paper, they want to know what's 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 been what's been done about this before. What what's the story? What's the backdrop? And so that background goes in the introduction. And then the next piece is the introduction has to state the question that was um, was the issue at hand, uh, and the central question of the hypothesis of the experiment, and then it finally a one sentence summary of the findings at the bottom of the abstract. And then you've got a really good um, product um, uh, to, to send. All right, methods and materials. I said it before, I'll say it again. This should be written before or whilst the research is still in progress. It can be, it can be detailed enough so that anyone can, or should be detailed enough 
so that if one wants to copy the, the experiment or the design of the study, it can be done without having to wonder what you did. And if it's work that you have done before, uh, you, um, you can reference yourself where appropriate. Here's where you need to talk about what you did in terms of human or animal use and approvals that are relevant to that and, um, and so on. And then the next portion of the manuscript is the results, the data, the, the, the findings. And here's where you need as few words as possible. The less text, the better. The more illustrative material, figures, tables, charts, graphs, um, icons, and so on, anything but words, as, as few words as possible. And you want to pre be able to present the main findings uh, to the reader. Um, here's where color uh, is also very important, various enhancements, different fonts, and so on and so on. And then the, the bottom of the manuscript is called the discussion. Here's where people get lost. It's like walking through a forest. They just get lost. And the way to avoid getting lost and make your discussion worthwhile is to follow these rules. First thing is at the first paragraph, what you want to do is answer the question that was posed in the introduction. All right. You wanted to find out the infection rate of craniotomies uh, on trauma patients. So the first thing your discussion is, we found that the infection rate of da 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 in trauma patients was X. So you've basically started the discussion with, with, some, with some factual information. And then people want to know, how does this relate to existing knowledge? Well, we found that our infection rate was half of that has been previously reported in the literature and twice what was expected. I mean, whatever it is, you should put that in there. So you set, set your results against the backdrop of extant literature and what are the facts known in the existing um, uh, space. And then the third thing you want to do in the, in the discussion right after that is to discuss the weaknesses, the discrepancies, and the limitations. And here's where subheadings are useful. And you might want to say, for example, uh, although we found that this um, infection rate was half of what was expected, our paper may not be accurate in that we only studied half the number of patients and we're not sure about the, about the robustness of our data. Okay, so that's a weakness or a discrepancy. So that goes in there. And then you've got to say what's new without exaggerating why it's important. And uh, you do not want to rehash all the results and every chart and every data point that is not necessary. Subheadings are good to organize your thought process and make it easy for people to digest and figure out what you're saying. And then finally, the conclusion, two, three sentences, maybe a paragraph perhaps at most, uh, as to what the conclusions are, summary statement, perspectives and maybe future work or implications for the study. All right. And then you find, finally, you get to the reference section. And here's where people just are very sloppy because they may not read the reference. They may just be putting references that were cited in some other paper and they may not be relevant. Or maybe there are references from 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And there's more recent work that would have been useful uh, to look at, and this is, you need to be a little tidy here. Be highly selective. You don't need to reference every last work. You need to reference the ones that are most pertinent and important to your paper. It helps if you yourself have read the reference, so you know exactly what you're quoting and not quoting. And of course, submit the material with the correct style for the journal. Um, some things you don't want to do that um, uh, are here and that uh, uh, journals will look out for, they'll look out for uh, uh, duplicate uh, submissions, plagiarism. They'll ask about conflicts of interest. That's very important, particularly if you're doing things like device studies or pharmaceutical studies, that sort of thing. Make sure that all your animal use concerns and disclosures relevant to human use are also properly taken care of or else they'll send it back to you with queries. Uh, to optimize your submission to a journal, make sure you pay attention to some of the logistics they're simple things, but they may delay the process of, of analyzing and reviewing and ultimately publishing your paper. Check the format and the, 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 uh, make sure you've got the right article type. So if it's a clinical study, say it's a clinical study. If it's a review, say it's a review. If it's a laboratory research, say it's a laboratory research. That's very helpful. So it goes into the right category. 
Some journals use blinding, some do not. Uh, we do, we use double blinding. Uh, so if there's blinding in the journal, make sure you strip your journal article of any identifications that are pertinent. Put in the co conflicts and the disclosures so people understand upfront where you're coming from. Um, again, if you're putting in uh, uh, pictures, uh, photographs, surgical videography, uh, quality is very important, resolution is very important, and so on. Materials should be cited, uh, particularly if they belong to other people, all the relevant permissions and so forth. And then for journals that use cover art, uh, if you want to have cover art, you may want to send that in as well. Um, some of the other things I've mentioned include this, and I'll pay attention to one thing is design of studies. Uh, make sure that the controls are there, the hypothesis is adequately stated, and um, and uh, be sure to use the um, guidelines for, for the equator network. Few words, of, uh, few things about writing and brevity and that sort of thing. Obviously, if the science is bad, the writing can't overcome it. But the same, at the same token, even if the science is good, you need to write well so that you can communicate. Good, definitive, specific, concrete language is important. Uh, and if you have trouble with it, send it off to someone whose first language is English. There are also ed editing services and so forth that are available. They're a little bit expensive, uh, but the cheaper ones out um, in, um, in India, they've got a lot of good editorial services that are not as expensive as in the West. Be brief, be brief, be brief. Um, you know, the journals have a finite amount of space, even in the digital space, they, 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 there is, a finite amount of space that journals want. So make sure that it's brief and the, the, the shorter and the punchier the writing is, the better um, um, it is. Here's a paper that I always like to cite. This is Watson and Crick's paper in Nature in 1953. It's the story of life, basically describing their findings about the molecular structure of nucleic acids, the double helix. They put this all in one page, one page. The entire shooting match is on one page and you can see that they had four, five references. So if the story of life can be told in one page, I'm sure the story of neurosurgery can be told in one page. Here are some examples of how not to be verbose. I just cited a few. And here's one uh, clause, a considerable amount of, that can go to many. So many, as opposed to a considerable amount of, this is one word and this is how many? forward. So this is a 30, <coughs> excuse me, a huge reduction, a 75% reduction uh, just by paying attention to brevity. Here's another one on account of because there's a there's another big example. So 30%, 70% and so on. Many examples like that. Avoid, avoid redundant hyperbole. Uh, people tend to use this a lot and give you some examples here. Extremely important. How about just important? Very deep, how about just deep? Overcrowded, how about just crowded, you know, and so on. So these are some examples, there are many others. Um, most journals, ourselves included, use reporting guidelines um, that are made uh, uh, by, created by the Creative Network and they cover various different kinds of article types. This is the consort, for example, for randomized control studies. They have various other ones uh, for um, reviews and systematic reviews case reports even, and so forth. It's always nice to um, train yourself in writing. And one of the best ways to train yourself other than reading and uh, using the, the resources I mentioned earlier on the internet is actually to engage in reviews yourself. You can read other people's work and that gives you an insight in common problems and mistakes. Major reasons for rejection about journals uh, from journals is usually because of lack of novelty or poorly executed studies, either in the design or the actual execution, well, uh, sometimes because it's inappropriate for the journal, sometimes because it's badly written. Um, when you get the paper back, it will have one of these uh, re uh, recommendations. If, uh, if you're lucky and it says revise, that's a good thing. Re re respond to the reviewers, take very good, um, uh, pay good attention uh, or, uh, to each comment, address each comment in detail and completely. And bear in mind that sometimes the reviewer is wrong. They don't know your work as much as you do. And if there's need to clarify, clarify. 
and make sure that every um, author participates in the review process. And beware of these predatory journals that are um, out there that are uh, asking authors to pay exorbitant sums of money to, to publish and of dubious academic uh, value of sometimes not even peer review. So thank you very much. I'm, uh, I think I'm right on time. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to entertain them. I'm sorry I have a shorter timeline than most of the other contributors uh, because of another obligation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, wonderful surgical way. Eh? Step by step, it's, it's a perfect way to do that. Uh, Joaquin, you, you follow uh, some questions, Professor Nelson or Salman, Professor Benzo? I, I or... think we should move on, actually. I, I didn't see any specific questions in the chat. And I think uh, Dr. Felix has to leave over the next presentation. Thank you. I think we just move on. Michael, are you going to give the, the presentation yourself or we show the recorded stuff? Why, why don't you show the, uh, Dr. Erkel, why don't you show the recorded version? Okay. But I will uh, kind of stay on uh, line uh, to address any questions. I also did submit some multiple choice questions. Uh, okay. I forwarded them again by email this morning, just so you know. Yeah, Imad okay, has them now, so, so Imad can play it at, them at, at the end. But and we can start, start now. Meta-analysis and systematic review. Hello, it's a pleasure to take part in this uh, WFNS a Spine Committee a Symposium on the pearls and uh, tricks related to uh, a, a publishing high-quality research. My uh, task today is to talk bit about meta-analysis and systematic uh, reviews. I'd like at the outset to thank Professor Salman uh, Sharif, the chair of the WFNS Spine Committee for this kind invitation and for putting this symposium together. No relevant commercial disclosures, but I do wish to uh, acknowledge two individuals. The first is uh, my PhD student and neurosurgery resident, Dr. Ali Mogadamji, and I'd also like to um, uh, recognize uh, Caitlin uh, Fuller from the University of Toronto Gerstein uh, Science Information a, a Center, and uh, she's an expert on uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and techniques to synthesize evidence are at the uh, top or pinnacle of the evidence-based medicine a, a pyramid. Uh, and narrative reviews are, in contrast, uh, really represent a form of expert opinion. And as such, these are of a significantly lower level of evidence. So there are essentially two types of literature reviews. So one em employs method-driven reviews or knowledge synthesis. And these are systematic reviews, scoping reviews and meta-analysis. And then of course there are narrative reviews. So uh, in a narrative uh, re review, um, and these can be a significant uh, a value if they are on a, on a novel uh, topic uh, written by experts who truly can uh, present a broad scope to the field. But there is the potential for authors to be very selective in what they include and exclude, and there's the potential for bias to arise. In contrast, um, techniques that use uh, knowledge uh, synthesis are um, a highly uh, a focused. There's a protocol that's generally in place and a uh, bias is minimized uh, because of the uh, transparent and reproducible search strategies that are employed. But it's important to point out that narrative reviews do have uh, value as emphasized in this publication. So here are the different types of knowledge synthesis approaches. And so you can have systematic reviews, and these may or may not include a meta-analysis. And we'll get into the details of what a meta-analysis might involve, but this is a quantitative synthesis of work. But you can do a systematic review where it may not be possible to do a meta-analysis, and you can 
uh, summarize this in a narrative format or in a more qualitative uh, type of a format. So, for example, with the with, with the use of uh, tables and figures to try to synthesize the data. And then there are scoping reviews, and these can be summarized in a narrative or in a qualitative fashion as well. Um, so these are the three established methods related to systematic reviews, scoping reviews, and narrative reviews. And I've tried to outline the differences that distinguish these from, uh, from narrative uh, reviews. And there are emerging uh, methods that um, that integrate uh, these different types of approaches. So, for example, there are mixed uh, methods, uh, 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 review approaches. There are ways to synthesize um, a narrative uh, uh, reviews, and there are what are called critical interpretive synthesis. And you know, this is beyond the scope of this introductory lecture, but just to make you aware that this is an emerging field. So let's again compare and contrast systematic reviews and uh, scoping reviews. And so one of the key uh, points uh, uh, here to look at um, with uh, a systematic uh, uh, review is that a priori you have the questions defined. And so very often uh, there are excellent reviews that are already in, in place um, and that you're really trying to drill down to this evidence. In contrast, a scoping review is often of, of, of help when you're just trying to synthesize uh, uh, the literature and to see what is out there. And then after the liter literature is synthesized, you can then post hoc um, examine some of the questions. And so, um, you know, I, of importance is that a systematic review is often very helpful to do as a precursor to a systematic uh, a, a review. Systematic reviews identify and inform areas for future research. So let's uh, now look at the different types of systematic reviews. So one can look at studies that focus on the effectiveness of, uh, of, a, of a treatment, experiential or qualitative approaches, uh, systematic reviews that focus on cost or economic valuation, one can look at systematic reviews focusing on prevalence and or incidence, etiology and or risk factors for a particular condition, as well as the synthesizing expert opinion and a public policy. So let's talk about the anatomy of a review. One needs a methodologically rigorous approach, a protocol or a plan, and a protocol-driven approach to information retrieval. And there are some tools that are available to help you. So there's the Cochrane Protocol, and the one that's increasingly preferred is what's called PRISMA. This is a preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And it's important when you undertake a systematic review that this be uh, registered. And the preferred tool to do this is Prospero. Scoping reviews um, also can potentially be deposited in protocols. For example, OSF registries is one such. And there are PRISMA checklists specific for uh, scoping reviews. So here's typically what a PRISMA diagram uh, will, will look like when you're doing um, uh, one of these uh, reviews. And it looks at uh, the records identified, uh, records after the duplicates removed, which ones were screened, which ones excluded, which were the full uh, text articles that you examined, and then uh, the studies included in either a qualitative or a quantitative uh, a synthesis. And Covidence is a tool uh, that can be uh, 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 that can be uh, uh, used, and you can read a bit more about this on the um, on, on the uh, internet. So Prospero is a technique to uh, register systematic uh, reviews, and Covidence is um, a, a software uh, a, a protocol to assist with a systematic re reviews, and then uh, there's also uh, the opportunity to actually get uh, expert uh, assistance, but there is a cost to this. So where to search? A variety of uh, uh, search engines as illustrated here, but Medline and Embase in overall provide the best overall coverage for health sciences uh, research. And then there are key databases. So Ovid is a key one. This has Medline, Embase, um, um, as well as the uh, Psych uh, Info uh, database. And there's then the Cochrane uh, Library, and other uh, libraries. So um, how do you now move forward? Well, it's important to formulate 
uh, the research question than to operationalize uh, the key uh, search uh, uh, concepts. And then you need a protocol driven search uh, strategy. Um, you need to then look at the database specific subject headings and then create text word uh, uh, queries uh, for this. Importantly, when you're undertaking a systematic review, you want to create what's called a PICO table. And this stands for population or patient problem, the intervention or the exposure, a, a comparison group, and then the outcomes that you're uh, 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 examining. So for example, you might look at a spinal cord injured population, the effect of early uh, surgery, the comparison might be no surgery or delayed surgery, and the outcome might be Asia motor score. Uh, recovery. In, in uh, systematic reviews, it's important to do an assessment of bias. And there are various different types of, uh, of, um, of bias that can uh, uh, arise. Uh, one of the um, uh, types of bias that I'll draw your attention to is, is multiple or duplicate publication bias. And this is where authors will publish uh, minor variations on the same uh, papers and the same uh, uh, a, a patient uh, a, a populations. And then there's other um, uh, types of biases, including outcome reporting bias, where you're only doing a selective reporting of some outcomes. For, so for example, uh, there's an, an inadequate reporting of complications. The grade uh, technique uh, and reporting tool is now the industry standard um, in, in the field to assess the overall body of evidence. And the great approach will classify the risk of bias as not serious, serious, and very serious. Um, in scoping reviews, it may be important to examine the gray literature. And this is information that lacks a clear cut bibliographic control, makes it a bit more difficult to find. So this includes documents uh, such as technical reports, book chapters, conference papers, and so on. And often it's very handy um, uh, to look at uh, books published in the field and look at book chapters and then examine the references here. So some of these people um, um, mix up what is a meta-analysis from a systematic review. They're different. Um, a systematic review is the generic, um, a generic term to systematically uh, examine the evidence, usually using a, a PICO table uh, to inform uh, that approach. A meta-analysis is a quantitative synthesis of the data arising from a systematic uh, review, and it provides a statistical approach to the uh, assessments. It improves precision, and it can often settle controversies arising from apparently conflicting studies, as well as synthesizing data together to increase sample size. In a meta-analysis, there is an assumption that the studies come from the same population, and that may not always be true. And you can assess this using uh, a technique called the Q-statistic. And it's outside the scope of this lecture to describe how this is uh, done, but you can link with um, your statistician and your librarians um, uh, to learn more about this. And then in addition, it's important to account for heterogeneity. And there are different statistical tools that you can uh, that you can do in terms of either applying what's called a random effects model or a fixed effects model. In uh, principle, a meta-analysis is a two-stage process. You first calculate a summary statistic for each study, describe the overall intervention effect in the same way for every study. And the second study, a summary or combined intervention effect is calculated as the weighted average of the intervention effects estimated in these uh, studies. And this shows uh, the formula for uh, doing this. And then meta-analyses are usually illustrated using the force plot. So this is uh, an example here. You have the different studies and here you have the means and the 95% uh, confidence in intervals. And then this is the pooled uh, uh, effect. And this is now a real world example of this. This is from some of my own work published last year in Lancet Neurology. And we did a pooled analysis of individual patient data from 1,548 uh, cases. And you'll see here uh, the different studies, um, including uh, the STASCIS, SIGEN, uh, the NACTIN registry, NASCIS three studies. Here are, is the effect of uh, surgery uh, on, uh, on motor uh, outcomes, light touch, pinprick, and Asia grade. And these are the um, means and 95% confidence uh, intervals, just illustrating the effectiveness of early surgical intervention for traumatic spinal cord injury. 
So in summary, in doing knowledge synthesis, it's important to frame the research question, to identify re relevant work, to assess the quality of the studies, to summarize the evidence, and interpret the findings. And the key points are to have a structured pre-planned approach to your search strategy, to utilize standardized tools such as Prisma and Grade, to utilize software such as Covidence and Prospero, to consider the use of grey literature searches, especially for scoping reviews, and then whenever possible, to conduct a quantitative meta-analysis. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this symposium, and I'm happy uh, to address questions. Well, thank you. So, um, I think you addressed already a couple of questions in the, in the chat. So, there was a question about what is mesh terms. Everybody can look uh, Dr. Feeling's answer already up in the chat, I think. There are no other questions right now. So thank you so much. I think it was a wonderful paper. And uh, we move on to Ed Benzo for giving us his view on how to write an excellent paper and publish it in the High Impact Journal. Ed, please. Thank you, Joaquin. Can you hear me and slide? Yes, slide. perfect. Great. I've been given the task of uh, publishing a paper in a high index journal, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm, I, uh, I'm fundamentally going to talk about manuscript writing. Um, a lot of what I have to say will be uh, a little bit of a repeat about uh, of, of what Dr. Oyuseku. Uh, presented, but most certainly take, looking at it from a different angle. Um, all journals are not alike. World Neurosurgery has uh, special, ish, special sections like the ones listed here um, that are somewhat different than, say, neurosurgery or a journal of neurosurgery. The one in particular, it, it, which caters to the international audience. Uh, of neurosurgeons is doing more with less. And I just show you an example of a very creative author who fashioned uh, dissecting tools uh, basically in his, uh, in his own shop uh, at home. Um, Dr. Oyuseku emphasized brevity. Uh, and I have a couple of quotes here that further emphasize, emphasize such. Uh, Mark Twain said, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Um, and Blaise Pascal said, I have made this longer than usual because I have not had time to make it shorter. So let's talk about a properly manuscript. Uh, and please understand that the vast majority of, uh, or the majority of manuscripts that all editor-in-chiefs receive are not properly constructed. Um, they consist of all of these uh, components as Dr. Oyuseku uh, discussed. Uh, and I emphasize uh, the potential use of subheadings in the, the introduction, uh, but particularly uh, the, uh, uh, the methods, results, and discussion sections. Uh, organize your thoughts before you write the paper. Create an outline and use the outline as a mechanism to define your subheadings. The subheadings cause the author to compartmentalize. One of the diff most difficult uh, things that uh, young authors uh, grapple with is the uh, putting uh, information that should be in the discussion in the results section and and, and uh, rambling a bit with their manuscript. If you have subheadings and you compartmentalize things, you can actually take them away before you submit if you like, but it causes you to put everything in the position it should be in within the manuscript. Please remember that the reader uh, is not familiar with the subject at hand. Make them familiar, but don't waste words. Tell them what they need to know, not everything you know. 
another common mistake with young authors is uh, putting in information that the readership already knows, and that is wasteful and uh, does not fit in with Dr. Oyuseko's uh, plea for brevity. So I'm going to talk about each one of these components um, um, in uh, separately. The title. The title should be a sparkling diamond. It should attract attention of the reader who is perusing a journal who will select your article to read based so solely, at least initially, on the title. The abstract is a summary. It catches the eye. It should be catchy or sensational if, if appropriate, but informative and descriptive. A clear message should be sent and it should sustain attention. So the author has looked, the reader has looked at the title and the abstract and says, okay, I want to read the manuscript. The introduction asks the question, why? Describe the problem, explain what that problem, why that problem is important. Next, briefly uh, review what has been done so far to solve the problem. And then finally, introduce the study by pointing out what is different about it compared to prior research. The materials or methods section answers the question how, include enough detail so that others can repeat the experiment, provide relevant details, describe treatment and control uh, groups. And this is an easy section to write first, hence begin here when you're writing your manuscript. Results answers the question, what? State only the results in the results section. Comments and explanations belong in discussion. The results section can be short. Much information can be presented in tables and or figures. Do not duplicate data presentation, i.e. in text, graph, and tables. Uh, the discussion answers the most important question, so what? Expound upon the results. Point out the importance of the data presented. Uh, compare the results with prior publications. Explain contradictory results, if any. Discuss statistical significance and chance, if appropriate. Discuss generalizability. Outline the limitations of your study. Suggest a future line of work, if appropriate. And finally, sum up with the conclusion, which should not overstate uh, what has been presented in the paper. It should be derived from the data presented and the data presented only. It should be um, rational and it should be useful, applicable, and novel, not sufficient to present, uh, it is not sufficient to present a large number of patients. Um, there are two types of plagiarism. Um, which is the practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off as one's own. There is innocent and malicious uh, plagiarism. Please keep in mind that all major journals use some sort of cross-check mechanism to look for phrases, sentences, and words that are used in prior publications. Here we see a significant amount of a manuscript um, having been highlighted that was taken directly from the uh, author's prior work. Um, and so uh, more often than not, uh, sometimes this can be malicious, like duplicate publications, publishing an article that has already <clears throat> been published by the same authors. But it is often a manifestation of uh, the uh, author being a non-English first language individual. And so they struggle with the English language and find paragraphs or sentences that look good, copy them, and they copy them and paste them. Please do not do that. Um, you may get uh, this message from me. Um, if you do, there are many unsighted phrases and sentences that are taken from prior publications. This precludes pu submission for review in its current form, hence the manuscript is rejected pre-review, the authors are encouraged to rewrite in their own words with English editorial assistance and resubmit to the world neurosurgery or elsewhere. Of particularly note is, is the words with English editorial assistance. If 
I feel and the section editors feel that the manuscript is appropriate for publication, but it just is not readable because of poor English. Uh, we offer a service provided by medical students and junior neurosurgery residents who will evaluate a manuscript, not for content, but only for English grammar and usage. Usage, grammar, and syntax are words that are frequently um, employed when discussing uh, an improperly written manuscript. Uh, grammatical refers to anything that has to do with sentences, punctuation, or the correct way to write or speak a language. Usage, is the way in which words or phrases are actually used, spoken, or written in a speech community. And syntax is the way in which linguistic elements, such as words, are put together to form cons the constituents, such as phrases or clauses. Um, I became acutely aware uh, uh, of the nuances of this when visiting um, Russia and the uh, several years ago. Um, and several uh, neurosurgeons uh, asked me to help them with a manuscript. And I saw that they were writing in English, but using Russian sentence structure. And uh, this is a very difficult uh, uh, obstacle to overcome. And it can be overcome, though, with assistance, as I outlined. Um, I refer you to three books. Um, one uh, is uh, Strunk uh, and White, uh, The Elements of Style. It is a simple little book that basically outlines all the rules of writing. Um, there's a, another book by Stephen King, the uh, uh, author, um, on writing. And it is a superb book and it illustrates how he takes thoughts and images from his brain and puts them into a, manu into a manuscript or a chapter or a book uh, that, uh, and makes it flow. And then um, the Cormac McCarthy, who um, is the author of No Country for Old Men and many other works um, and a professional writer, if you will, um, outlines some very relevant uh, uh, recommendations regarding publication. Use minimalism. You've heard that about five times today to achieve clarity. Remove extra words or commas whenever you can. Decide on your paper's theme and two or three points you want every reader to remember. If something isn't needed to help the reader to understand the main theme, omit it. Limit each paragraph to a single message. I think that is, goes along with uh, compartmentalization and doing an outline up front. Keep sentences short, simply constructed and direct. Try to avoid jargon, buzzwords, or overly technical language, and don't use the same word repeatedly. It's boring. Don't over-elaborate. Only use an adjective if it's relevant. Don't say the same thing in three different ways in a single section. Choose concrete language and examples. When you think you're done, read your work aloud to yourself or a friend. Find a good editor you can trust and who will spend real time and thought on your work. I say read it to yourself, preferably aloud. You see things that you don't see when you just go over the manuscript again. Finally, try to write the best version of your paper, the one that you like. You can't please an anonymous reader, but you should be at least able to please yourself. And when you make your writing more lively and easier to understand, people will want to invest their time in reading your work. From the journal's perspective, we have thresholds. For example, World Neurosurgery does not any longer accept case reports. Uh, uh, case reports have unique information, rare, not uncommon cases, and unique lessons learned um, but they've got to be good to be published anywhere, and we have decided to not publish case reports. The manuscripts must be of archival value. Um, when you revise a manuscript, uh, address all comments in a revised manuscript in the text of the manuscript uh, in red or track changes or in some way. 
do not argue with the reviewers. Uh, editors and reviewers despise arguments. Um, address them, make comments, uh, have a collegial dialogue. What if your manuscript is rejected? Well, what was your motivation? Uh, is this work worthy of dis dissemination? Have I optimally prepared the manuscript? Do I trash it? Do I resubmit or submit elsewhere? Bottom line, heed the critiques. The reviewers are professionals and, and experts in the field. Take them very seriously, honestly self-assess. If you resubmit, heed the critiques. Um, plagiarism, one last shot at that. Uh, be very careful um, to uh, uh, watch for misrepresentation or not misrepresent your data. Um, and try to avoid conclusion-based research. Conclusion-based research is research that is designed to prove a point. And there's a ton of bias that can be introduced when that is done. And again, there are two types, in my opinion, of plagiarism, um, innocent, which we've already discussed, and malicious, uh, which we have discussed. Um, it's in, malicious is intentional and overt plagiarism, the practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off of their, as their own. Conclusion-based research um, um, as, is often hypothesis-driven um, and uh, process-based research is designed to find the truth, exploratory inquiry. Uh, Conclusion-based research uses frequentist probability strategies and process or based research or exploratory inquiry uses Bayesian probability, probability strategies. Try to seek the truth. There is so much information that is subsequently found to be not true or false. And there's an, a growing literature on false findings. Uh, the truth wears off. Um, and we're, most of us are aware of uh, Scott's parabola where an idea is had, um, studies are done that are biased, conclusion-based research. It contains, it gathers momentum and it becomes, the strategy becomes a standard of treatment. But then some authors start to look at this and cannot reproduce the data. Then more and more data is, uh, is uh, uh, shown that the manuscript, uh, the original manuscripts were false and it falls into oblivion. The area under this curve is huge. And there can be, particularly if this is regarding industry studies, uh, can be very um, harmful and financially devastating and, and lucrative for the various sides of the coin. The peer review pot process, manuscripts are peer reviewed, letters to the editor are not. They're only reviewed by me. Uh, an expert, expert Pedited review, sometimes people ask for this, has two components. Editorial peer review is not altered. The production process <clears throat> is what is streamlined. You need a clear definition of the peer review process. Each journal must have that, which is mandatory. Now, I not infrequently get letters, angry letters from authors who have been rejected by scholarly reviewers and section editors. I make this statement. All authors feel that their manuscript is worthy of publication, every single one of them. Unfortunately, World Neurosurgery and other neurosurgery journals reject nearly 80% of submitted manuscripts. So obviously the majority of authors are wrong, at least in the opinion of the experts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, a very uh, nice presentation. So um, I don't see in the chat any specific questions for you, Ed. Mike was asking some questions on the chat. Mike, are you there? Uh, you're come, you can read in the, in the uh, chat. Mike has three, two questions, three questions for uh, Ed. You have it, or shall I read it? I don't see anything. Okay, in the chat, Mike says, um, 
for Professor Ed Benzel. Do the subheadings in different section annoy the um, editor of a journal? It does make the author's work easy, but what does the editor want? Do you want well, subheadings I, or you don't, don't want I subheadings? I don't mind subheadings at all. Uh, and you don't have to keep them in, in the actual submission. But I think as you're writing the manuscript, it is a very good way to compartmentalize every little piece of information in the place where it needs to be um, um, recorded. Uh, so I, I like subheadings. I wouldn't excessively use them, uh, but they can, all, they can be uh, taken away when the ma manuscript is actually published or submitted, excuse me. Okay, and um, uh, one of the residents just sent me a message asking that, um, I, do editors have favorite topics or all topics are favorite for them? Well, um, I'm a spine surgeon, as are you, Selman, um, and that would be my favorite topic. Um, having said that, um, we must, editors must be non-denominational and egalitarian in this regard. And I work aggressively to treat all uh, topics the same. Um, I'm sorry, Ed, that was just, just you. Yeah. Yes, you do, it's all yours. So, thank you, Professor Benzio, who has always wonderful presentation. You know, I participate in this this pandemic in hundreds and hundreds of webinars. My few webinars like this one gives so useful in information that you can get to our community around the world, you see. I wanna ask you something, Professor. The world is completely different. The, the country, they, they are completely different. The facilities are completely different. The reality is completely different. As the world neurosurgeon, you consider when the paper are coming from undeveloped country, the reality that he has, that they have in their country, see, to show to the world, but not, not show to the science the high level, but what is important in his region to improve the, the, the management of the patients in his region. I don't know if, if you under, understood what I want to yes, say. Yes, I do. So th the mission of world neurosurgery is a bit different than neurosurgery and uh, journal of neurosurgery. Um, the mission is a global mission and striving to um, publish articles from uh, lower and middle in, uh, income countries. Um, and so we have topics like doing more with less, but uh, um, understanding practice patterns in different parts of the world, um, uh, understanding um, um, how to write. Um, we still reject a lot of manuscripts, but it, the World Neurosurgery provides an outlet for those surgeons in lower and middle income countries uh, to publish papers that might not be on, uh, you know, DNA, the double helix, uh, yeah. or, uh, you know, not rocket science, but how to do things, etc. But nevertheless, many, if not most of the publications in world neurosurgery are first rate publications. They're, they, they, they can compete well with other journals, but our purpose isn't to have a high impact factor. Our, our purpose is to provide content for the neurosurgeons, for all neurosurgeons globally, and an outlet for writing and dissemination of information. That Thank is you, a question by, by a medical student, and she's asking that, what is the scope of um, um, papers or any kind of um, article written by medical students in a journal like World Neurosurgery? Is this, would you like to see them write case reports? Would you like to see them write meta-analysis or what would you like to see well, from we, medical We don't study? accept case reports. It will transfer them to a sister journal if they come in. Um, medical students usually should have a mentor um, and write with a seasoned faculty person 
or at least a resident. Um, the uh, articles that they write are just like any other article. They should, they have to meet in order to be published, have to meet the same standard that any other article would meet in, in publications, whether it be Neurosurgery Journal of Neurosurgery or World Neurosurgery. Did, that, did I answer that? Yes, you did. The, there's another question. Why case reports are not um, accepted by or published in World Neurosurgery anymore? Um, well, I told a little, a little fib or lie a bit, bit ago when I, when I said um, we uh, are not in, interested in impact factor. We're not as interested in impact factor as much as other journals. But um, we, it seemingly was that uh, at one point that we had uh, far too many, high, far too high of a percentage of manuscripts were case reports. And we clearly understand that that drives down impact factor. And we started looking at them carefully and their value to our readership um, wasn't high. Um, and remember, uh, a case report is a case report. Two cases are still a case report. Three cases or more are a series. Okay. Uh, so, so you're hinting that, you know, maybe case series might be worth sending to one new surgery if, they, if you have some good case series. Yeah. yeah. And if somebody has a, a great earth shaking case report, um, and, and I mean earth shaking, um, they should email me and send the manuscript and I, I can override our little rule if necessary. So another question for Ed, uh, there is how long is the learning curve for a non-English speaker to improve their manuscript? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, it obviously, some, some people uh, pick things up very quickly. Other people never pick up the language issues. So I, I can't really answer that. Um, but I can tell you that working, writing a manuscript and having uh, our section editors, our reviewers, and myself say, you know, there's something there, but we cannot publish it in this form. And then they have the, uh, not the content changed, because that's their job, but they have the manuscript uh, altered by the medical student or junior neurosurgery resident uh, to make it readable. Um, that process helps them a lot. They learn from seeing how their manuscript uh, could be changed to become more readable. And that probably builds, that. well, not probably, most certainly builds on itself as they meander through the abyss of manuscript writing, et cetera. Okay, good. Um, there is another question from, um, from the YouTube guys. And um, this is a question for uh, Professor Feeling. Um, Michael, so the question is basically for you, how did you manage to publish so much? And how do you get that quality good every time? Well, I'm, thank you very much for the question. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not sure if it's a question or a compliment, but I'm very humbled by that. Um, okay, so I, I would say that... Um, uh, there, you know, there are a few things. So, so one is to kind of develop, uh, you know, particular areas of focus for yourself and to, you know, to think about the depth and the quality. So I think in general, the depth and the quality is still more important than quantity. Okay. So, uh, so I would, and I would try to pick important questions and in research, I think, one of the hardest things to do and the most critical thing to do is to formulate really an excellent question that's novel, that's important, and that's answerable. So that's one point. The second thing is, um, is to form collaborations and the collaborations can be local, national, and international. So reach out to people in your community, in your hospital, at your university. And um, so, you know, many, many minds will help uh, to solve uh, uh, issues and many hands make the work lighter. So that's an approach. And then at the national level, uh, organizations in your countries, 
And this can then also be facilitated through international organizations, so like such as this one, the WFNS. And I indicated other organizations, um, you know, in the uh, you know in the in the in the chat line, depending on who you know, and um, you know, and 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 so on. So certainly, the collaborations can definitely uh, you know facilitate you know facilitate this kind of work. I think that's brilliant, Dr. Farida. What about you? Um, how would you suggest you know how young young trainees or neurosurgeons or trainees in any area? How do they select a topic and how do they go about it uh, to make sure they get something out of it at the end of the day? You're muted. Sorry, you're muted. Yeah. yeah unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Um, I have actually already answered a lot of questions in the chat box, so I'm sure all the participants are okay with it. Um, yes, I agree with you that our uh, the, the residents and the trainees need to come up with good quality research from their training years, uh, and, and the best way to go about it is to learn how to write a protocol, because that's the basic foundation of your research. So you should know how to plan your research, and if your research is planned and properly, then only you could execute it. As I said, a lot of times we have so much of data around us that it's like sort of an urge to actually publish it. But, you know, just, just randomly picking up data and trying to take out papers from it is, is actually not a good idea. You should, first of all, plan your research, make sure it's ethical and, and something which is uh, novel, and then publish it. And I'm sure you can get uh, it published in good journals if it's, it, it, it's, it comes to that mark. Okay, good. Well, uh, there is a question, and this this is actually for Nelson, but Nelson is not here. How to recognize a predatory journal to avoid submitting manuscripts? Um, I suppose, Ed, that's for you. Yeah, um, well, usually they're the journals that uh, ask for publications with that come in e random emails with bulk written on it as a header. Um, Basically, a predatory journal, if you want to go for, uh, for non-predatory journals, stick with what you know. You know, if you're a spine surgeon, it would be spine, the spine journal, um, if uh, you're, or a any other specialty journals, um, and world neurosurgery, neurosurgery, uh, journal of neurosurgery, they are not predatory. Um, and read the fine print. Uh, sometimes they don't tell you that there's a charge until they've accepted your manuscript. Uh, but just do not hesitate to pull it all back. Um, th there's a, uh, there was another question that was listed here and it went away. Um, um, I, I might just speak uh, briefly about that, and then I have to leave the, the meeting. Th thank you very much for the invitation. So I support what uh, Dr. Benzel has indicated. So um, I, I would, in general, stick to the journals that you do know, uh, the ones with reputation. Um, you can always go online to check the journals. Do they have an impact factor? Um, you know, are they uh, listed on PubMed? And then be leery of these mass emails, and usually they have very high uh, publication fees. So just be just be leery of this. And those are usually kind of the warning signs: uh, mass email, big publication fees. They're not listed on PubMed. They don't have an impact factor. It, it's questionable, kind of what their web presence is. That that sort of thing. Th those are the classic warning features. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Be well. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. It, was, it was wonderful to have you. Um, if I yes, can add to this a little bit, sure. there's a difference between predatory and open access. Um, world world uh, neurosurgery has an open access option. This is much more common in Europe than it is in North America. And you pay uh, to publish, but it gets submitted or it gets published uh, free of charge to anybody. Regular journals, have to, the reader has to have a subscription or their library has to have the subscription so that they can read the manuscripts. Open access is open to everybody. So there's, the, the, there's just two ways of deriving uh, revenue and uh, publishers cannot do this for free. 
Okay. Um, Luis, if it's okay, can we go through our um, questions, multiple choice questions that we have uh, given to our um, uh, participants so see if, if they've answered? Uh, uh, Imad, can you please share? Thank you. Um, is this uh, Dr. Farida's? This is Ed's yours. Ed, would you like to take this? this is, these are your questions. Sorry, you're muted, Ed. I apologize. Yes, conclusion is, uh, is the correct answer. Great. So yeah, half of the people got it right, but I think we need to improve on this. Okay, next. Sparkling diamond. Idle is the appropriate answer. It's got, to, it's got to attract the uh, eye of the reader so that okay. they keep going. Good, next. Most important component of a revision after review by the general? A is correct. Very good. Don't argue. <laughs> Just uh, uh, address it in the text of the manuscript. Okay. Best way to prevent false findings? Using exploratory inquiry strategy. Okay, so for whatever reason, majority of the people thought it was employing respected. Well, um, prospective um, randomized trials usually are hypothesis based and they can, they can be very useful, um, but they can also be very deceptive. Um, and we all know that you can write a study design and do a study to prove almost anything you want. And a good example of prospective randomized trials is the, are the multiple trials for uh, uh, artificial discs. Uh, every surgeon in the trial is pro-disc, pro-artificial disc. Patients want the, uh, the artificial disc and therefore are, are biased if they, don't receive the disc artificial disc option. They feel like they've lost. If they get the artificial disc option, they feel like they have won the lottery. Uh, and so all these things introduce bias into the study. And, um, and so prospective randomized trials can be abused tremendously. Okay, next, that's, that's very helpful. What to do if the manuscript is rejected? So Ed, you'll ask this manuscript. So I, it's, it's, they're correct. Ask if the manuscript is really worth publishing. And if so, revise and resubmit, usually elsewhere. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's, that's very good. Okay. Right, whose is this? Is this Dr. Farida yours? Yes. Yes, please, I already you can answered it during my session. So good. Yes, it, so, yeah. so operational definitions should be um, very measurable and specific to your own study, not the book definitions. All right, good. Next. Okay, so again, because you know the, the, the first one was a shorter one, so a lot of people didn't think that that's the correct one, but for your study, that's the correct one. All right, fair enough. Next. So we have already done this, despite that many people got it wrong. Maybe some people were not there earlier. Okay. A most appropriate study design for objectives. Yes, that's, that's a survey. So cr cross-sectional study design is the best, uh, the most appropriate study design. 
Good. Next. To compare risk factors associated with the yeah. brain versus cervical injury after road traffic accident. Yes, but the majority have written a case control study, and that's the correct answer because you know to uh, see the association of a risk factor with the outcome, either you could do a case control study or a prospective cohort study. But it's a, it's sort of a um, it's prospective, so it takes a long time. Okay, next. So the yes, inclusion criteria, yes. So yeah. the inclusion criteria is all patients visiting ER after a road traffic, uh, after motorcycle RTA. So all patients visiting ER after motorcycle RTA. Uh, so only 22% answered it correctly. So, you know, people need to understand the uh, basic basis of inclusion criteria. Okay, next. So the, the correct answer was patients brought dead on arrival after motorcycle RTA, because of course you cannot explore them more. It's not ethical and you wouldn't want to get any investigations done on them to see the severity of cervical injury. All right, wonderful. Great, thank you. Okay, whose is this? I'm guessing this is Dr. Failings. Yeah, so I think um, what we basically said, systemic review with meta-analysis, that's what we talked about. And majority got it right. Okay, next. Uh, following most accurate distinguishes a narrative review from systemic review. So systemic review provides a more insightful analysis. And uh, I have no idea what it means. Dr. Farida has to help us here. Yes, maybe, maybe Benzil can help us because, you know, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's probably uh, A, C, and D. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, you're right. Okay, next. Okay, it should be reviewed by... And we talked about That's it, yes. D, D is the right answer, yes. Yeah. So they have to be registered, yeah. Okay, next. Uh, following techniques to synthesize and summarize the evidence from a systemic review. So a, uh, actually all of synthesis, quantitative and matinous, all three. Okay, good. Next. Uh, which of the following techniques are used to summarize the quantitative synthesis of evidence in meta-analysis? So we talked about forest plots uh, using means with the 95% confidence interval. Yeah, okay, good. Are we done? Uh, Luis, your comments before we finish. Uh, I just want to say something. You have a lot of medical students, residents, and partners that come with ideas. Oh, I have one idea. I have one. Everybody has a good idea. And every day I receive my office, people like this have, have ideas. But the most important is to follow the idea. If you wanna do some good, if you wanna write a paper, you make a make change, follow your ideas. Maybe in the future, your idea can change many, many things. I, I always say when, when I was in Little Rock, Dr. Omefti, <laughs> many years ago, just to say something, came a guy from Middle East country. And he arrived in, the, in his office and said, oh, Dr. Omefti, I have this great idea, thing like that. And Dr. Omefti turned around and looked at the table. You see, look that, it's our ideas. Everybody has ideas, but nobody follow his own idea. You see, is this the science? This way to do the thing different. Our mind is brilliant, 
every day you have something different. And these young people that is watching now, see, they can change and can do a wonderful work, a wonderful paper in, in, this, in this journal. The way to write, the way to read, we will learn. But the idea is in our mind. And you, from any part of the world, can do it. Developed country, undeveloped country, you have the mind. You can do this from any part. Thank you, Osama, for the great opportunity to participate of this webinar. It was a wonderful, wonderful morning here in Brazil. Today is Saturday. Sun, maybe I'll go to run or go to the beach, <laughs> but it's a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Luis. It was wonderful as always. Uh, Dr. Farida, before we wrap up and come to Ed, um, any comments? Thank you very much for inviting me over and I would be happy to help uh, all the trainees and uh, uh, undergrads and postgraduate uh, trainees with their uh, researches, with their protocol writing, with their manuscript writing. And I can take workshops for you as well for uh, SPSS and, um, and note manager also. So let me know if I can help. Okay, wonderful, um, Ed. Well, I, I think this has been great. Um, I, I hope uh, that this is uh, this uh, workshop has inspired the young neurosurgeons to uh, to follow their ideas, as mm -hmm. Luis pointed out, and to uh, work at becoming. If they are already, if you already are good authors, and and uh, then keep it going and improve further. And if not, work at it. And there's mechanisms to do that, that we've outlined today. Okay, wonderful, Ed, uh, Dr. Farida, Luis, I think wonderful, it was, uh, it was an amazing uh, uh, webinar. I'd, I'd request everybody to switch on their videos if they're still there so that we can have a group photograph and then we wrap up. Please switch on your videos, thank you. Okay, please switch on. Sandeep, you have any comments? Are you, there's four pages of this. Are you able to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Imad is able to take pictures. He's, he's used to this. Uh, Sandeep, are you going to say something? Hello. Can, can you unmute yourself? Uh, Imad, can you unmute Sandeep, please? Yes, sir. I'm doing that. Sandeep, you're muted. I was just saying that I loved all the talks, and, and it is always a pleasure to listen to you. You're always to the point and very clear. And I hope my juniors have learned a lot from you because I made everybody listen to this uh, webinar. Well, thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Can we have pictures then, um, Imad? Thank you. Everybody smile, please. Ed, we need your smile. Thank you. Well, come on. <laughs> uh, Louis, look at Louis. You know, the way he's smiling. Sun is out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Imad, you done? It's done, thank you. All right, so thanks everybody. And hopefully we will have another one of these in uh, three months time. And uh, just to let Luis and Ed and Dr. Farida know in advance. It was wonderful having you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well. Thank you. I appreciate okay, bye -bye. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.